Next uh, person, next scholar. Uh, George Kritiker is from my university, which is where I have taught for many years, in the School of Public Policy, which is the University of Maryland College Park. Uh, welcome to George. He is a lecturer and uh, he coordinates a certificate in African Studies uh, at the UMD College Park. Uh, his research, writing and teaching are focused on Africa and African diaspora with a particular interest on memory and heritage of slavery, forced migrations, religion, race, slavery, <coughs> Pre-colonial and post-colonial colonial Africa, independence movements, and blacks and world politics. Uh, we have a lot to discuss after this uh, presentation also, George. I look forward to having some you know, time with you. Uh, he has been a, also uh, associated with the Howard University and Virginia Commonwealth University, and with the American Historical Association and Association of African Historians and has published uh, articles on uh, African empires of Western Sudan, West Central Africa, uh, and has engaged in the oral history project in Prince George's County. Uh, he has studied in, uh, you know, institutes uh, Saint Eugene, the Mazenon, affiliated to Urbania University in Rome, and also in history and religious studies with a PhD in history from Howard University. Uh, where he has trained in the question of slavery, race, religion, colonialism, and blacks and world politics. Over to you, George. So please limit your talk to less than 15 minutes so that we have some time for questions and answers later as we are running late. Back to you. Thanks so much for having me. And I'm sorry, um, I went in the wrong direction. GPS took me completely far away and I'm to turn around. Um, <clears throat> I really became interested in the question when I was a graduate student. And uh, it was a question on um, um, migration. And that's when uh, the question of really uh, genocide popped up and um, completely changed the course of the class. And ever since, so it became one of uh, my uh, interests. So I just want to talk a little bit about the human definition and give you some perspective and uh, some. Um, Personal um, input that I have on that. So I have three quick points. Uh, I want first to go talk about the convention and then um, the key facts, and then um, what can we do to get as a community um, to look into this question sometimes uh, forgotten because of different reasons, political especially. And then especially look at what's going on today, it's just a far cry that uh, the UN is not living up to its own thing. So, um, Let's just look uh, quicker uh, when uh, the, the UN came to be founded. It was because of the mess we found ourselves as a community of people. So, towards the end of the war, uh, the UN assigned itself for uh, a goal. One of the main goals um, for the foundation of the, the UN was to prevent future wars and maintain peace and security around the world. So, one of the bigger questions was, uh, how to protect uh, the minority people and the weak especially. So, um, the, among, among the, the many, many goals, not just that, but also <coughs> human rights. Uh, so, how to do our best to deliver really aid to those places that were really deeply affected and um, to work together as a community of human beings to support um, uh, certain uh, uh, project or development and also for climate actions, uh, actions. But also, what can we do to uphold this law? Because uh, as a human being, the temptation is one of the bigger microphones is the one whose voice has been heard. So that's what we call usually the law of ideological gravitation. Because I'm powerful, I've a bigger microphone, so everything must be done according to the way I see. If not, uh, so it's not clear, it's not correct. So. That's the, bigger, uh, the biggest thing. And uh, if you have a chance to go to the UN in New York, as soon as you enter, the first thing they hit you, there's a bigger picture of the globe, broken world. And I really like that picture because uh, it gives a nice view of uh, where, we, where are we now as a people, as a community. So 
Uh, and the work is that uh, we can try to fix that the world has been broken. So the, the so, first... Uh, George, yes. this is a former UN official round, so we're talking about the UN. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <Yeah. laughs> so, um, the first genocide, the word genocide first itself really um, was coined for the first time by a Jewish, uh, <coughs> Jewish lawyer, Polish. Um, uh, thank you, thank you. So uh, it was coined by uh, Raphael Lemkins, um, and uh, were, for the first time we find the word in his book, uh, uh, Axis Rule in... Uh, uh, John, may I request you to sort of, you know, not lay the premise of the talk, but get into the content of the discussion of the African history, because all this we can read later. Sure. But we have very little time because we'd like to also have some question answers. No so yeah, instead of the generalities, focus on the specifics. Thank you. Okay. So, just I want to focus a bit on uh, the, the, the African uh, side of the question. So, what we see um, in general, Africa is also is one of those continents, uh, just listen to the previous presenter, Africa is one of those continents that really, really gone through so much of these cases and most of them, the majority of them, have been completely ignored. From the time of, uh, from the colonial time, we see there are some cases already and this one thing that many people sometimes forget to point to. For instance, the case of the Nama and Herero people. Before the genocide of the Jews, took place, the Germans were first in Namibia, practicing what they did in, uh, uh, in, in Germany. After they really mastered the technique for doing that uh, in Namibia, they almost extinguished two nations, we don't call tribe in this way because of their negative connotation, but uh, they almost exterminated the Nama and the Herero. And if you have a chance to go in those regions where these two nations, the Herero and the Nama lives in, uh, in Namibia, it's almost uh, a desert land, uh, almost nobody there. So the techniques were really, really, really well um, mastered. And finally, that will be, they will take that in uh, Germany to do it. And in many, many cases, nobody talk about that. So another thing also, um, during, the, during uh, the genocide in, uh, uh, in Namibia, not just the, the German will do it, but we will also see the Portuguese uh, will adopt that as well. The Portuguese in Angola will do the same thing. And you go further north in the Congo, of course, uh, King Leopold was really, really known for that as well. Um, from, um, from cutting hands and uh, from just ostracized people, so we know that it became something very, very serious. You go further north in the Cameroon. In the Cameroon, that's something that many people don't talk about it at all. During the time of independence, we saw the French, the French really uh, in the war, uh, war, the French as well, uh, almost exterminated the entire north, northeast part of the Cameroonian um, population there. And no, nothing was really reported, and that if you search for it, you can't find nothing, unless you do field work, like I did, you begin to ask the question people, they will talk about the war, the, the war of war, and uh, it was really an entire genocide of almost two other nations uh, completely gone. Cannot find it in history books. So, you go further north from Cameroon, you go further north uh, uh, in Nigeria, the northern part of Nigeria, we found also so many, many cases uh, of genocide as well, and nobody talked about it. And if you look uh, what the UN is doing, they will send all these submissions of peace. But in reality, if you look, is uh, this much more technological advanced country because of some um, interest, especially economical interest. So they will try to support the particular actions and particular missions, but the main goal is not just to really establish PCC. And if you go and talk to some people on the ground, they will tell you none of those missions for the UN, we, should, we really don't need it. It's really better for them to go than they being here because now it was first the killing and that is the exploitation of human beings. So from the killing, we move now into exploiting people because of the resources. So, fast forward, if you move far beyond Nigeria, 
You keep going further towards West Africa. You go, for instance, uh, uh, in Niger and Mali. We don't talk about what's going on today. That's some of the cases there, they were completely ignored. Nobody never talked about it. So we see there's so many different cases of, of uh, genocide taking place, uh, especially in those uh, poor countries. The reason is not known because they don't have a big or powerful microphone. And people sometimes ask, uh, where's the UN? If it was there for peace. And we come to realize that now, uh, from our personal research, I've come to the conclusion that uh, political, in, political and economical interests are the driving force where we see sometimes the UN organizing some missions. But uh, if it does uh, hurt uh, or if it does not go against uh, the the need, if it does not go against uh, um, what a, another powerful nation is pushing for, that will not take place. And even so, they have to choose exactly who can go or who cannot go there. So, in a nutshell, we'll say that uh, this is something bigger than uh, the UN see the need to do a lot of work in terms of really alleviating the suffering of the pain. So genocide, if you look at it, uh, um, and you also go through some of the documents of the UN, you uh, will Dr. realize Kibiba, that yes. some more specific discussion yes. uh, will be useful because we'll have to conclude in the next uh, two, three minutes yes. because we want to get into question answer. So if there's anything very specific about uh, you know the subject of uh, African slavery, African genocide, etc. Let's sure. talk about that and then conclude. Thank you. Sorry for the interruption. So I will just give you two lines that I will reserve it during, during the, the interaction time. So in the, in the conclusion, I will say that uh, what we see in Africa today, there are so many nations who are still crying, even asking about uh, the need of the UN. Why? Because uh, there are so many nations ethnic or tribe, you call them as you want to, they are still asking for help, but they're not there. And they begin to ask, is it truly important to have such an organization because it's not living up to its ideal? And that's where I will stop and I will get into deeper when we get into the discussion. Thank you so much. I request you